Um, what's your reaction to what you read in the case? A lot of problems. A lot of problems. A very big, famous company with some great products, but at the moment, you're having a lot of problems. This is not unusual. Some of our best clients that have the biggest problems are good, are uh, very well-known, very famous companies. Cassandra? Um, I kind of got the sense that um, when, you, when you dig down into it, people kind of knew what was underlying the problems, but it wasn't being communicated across. Okay. So it was kind of it's something different at each level of the organization that was sort of feeding into this dysfunction, but um, it didn't seem like, it seemed like levels were siloed. Uh, That's what we were waiting for? Yes, yes. <laughs> hey, I wouldn't show this up at the U of U. <laughs> okay. But, I mean, let's, let's fast for a minute. Now, I, actually, what I want to do is, this is a sneaky way to get us to this. We had one performance in Virginia, and I, I want to say as a loyal fan, I stayed with it to the bitter end. It was bitter from the beginning, and I stayed with it to the bitter end. But this one was sweet. Now, as an organizational designer, look at those elements and let's just highlight maybe three or four things that we know that the team did between week one and week two that would explain a difference in the results. Because in Virginia, the only stakeholders that were happy were the Virginia fans and the Virginia team. Those are not the stakeholders we're trying to please. So in the second week, we had a lot of other things. Look at the elements here. These, these are elements that, that a, a company can deal with given what the stakeholders expect and what the results are that they have delivered. The, these are the elements that they can have an influence on. So from what you know, what do you know the team did differently between weeks one and two? They mixed up the offensive line. Okay. Which box? People. People and structure. structure. Some of the same players, but in different positions. I won't mention names, but the left tackle against Virginia was a real embarrassment. I think there were some things going on there. But when you look at the system, you can't have a big heart to an element of the system that is underperforming. We had a client, uh, actually one of your students did an internship with me one summer. And we had a local business, and they, were, they had a lot of good things going for them, but they were struggling. And the one thing we found was that in one of the steps of their process, those that were doing that were totally substandard. And the boss said, well, yeah, but there's nothing I can do because, you know, they got families to feed and all that. And I said, I'm amazed that you're not more committed to the success of your company. And he told me just, this was years ago, he told me just recently, he said, that, that conversation still sticks in my mind. I was putting the needs of two people above the rest of our needs, including feeding my family. Once they made the changes, coincidentally, they had the most profitable quarter they had ever had in their history because they knew from our diagnosis two or three things to do. They were not hard to do, except emotionally. They made those changes, and all of a sudden, the business jumped forward. So, okay, so they made some changes on the of who was playing what position on the offensive line. What else? Well, I think that Bronco had said that the first week they were they were blocking the right people, but they weren't blocking hard. Okay. And so part of it was just that they were a lot of them were new players. They, you know, it was the first game. But then the second game, they actually started playing hard and delivering on what they needed to do. Okay. So the coaches, based on what they saw on the, on the film, realized there was a skill deficiency, and that's where we come to this box. Okay, offensive line, you're playing fast, but now you've got to hold those blocks a lot longer. Uh, did we see that Saturday night? Yeah, we did. Texas saw it. I was, I, was, I was petrified because I knew Texas had a bunch of big, mean players that were going to be good, and the way our offensive line had played against Virginia, I thought, are you kidding me? Well, those, those changes made a difference. What else? Um, kind of going along with people and processes, you know, if your passing game isn't working, then you run and stay and okay. switch that up. Okay. And so we'll see how that goes, you know, in the future now that there's all that game tape of our quarterback rushing from 240 yards. <laughs> we, we better get the passing game cranked up. Because, see, here's the point. If your offense is one-dimensional, any team can eventually adjust. 
even in the Lavelle Edwards years with some great quarterbacking, there, there were teams that learned how to play us. That's why our bowl record was not very good. They had two weeks to prepare against what they knew we were going to do, and we didn't have that much of an option. So the balance is key. But anyway, they certainly they, they made the move. There was another change in process at Bronco. Refer I'm sorry, Brady, go ahead. Uh, I'm going on the capability. So go ahead. Uh, we learned how to play in a wet field. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. And, and I noticed there was there was a little bit of an alibi or excuse in the first week, and the second week, Bronco said, "Well, you know, it rained too, but you know, we we learned how to deal with that." And and, and it's not an excuse because it rained on the other side of the field too. Okay. There was another one over here. Please. I just heard a lot after the game of the players saying the practice was very different. So the process of practice. I, I listened to the Bronco video post game, and he said uh, the intensity in the practice that the coaches called for and that the players expected out of that defeat was at a, the highest level he's ever seen in his entire coaching experience. He said the practices, by mutual consent, there was a fire to get it done and to go harder and, and, and to drive harder. So, okay, now, see? Even the model can explain the difference between a football game. And I can tell you from other years of BYU that uh, same things have happened. And quite frankly, during our worst years that I was here, before <coughs> the Bell took over, the BYU teams were not right here. I had a neighbor who uh, said to me, he was a non-member when he came here. He said, the coach told us non-members regarding the honor code. I don't care what you do, just don't get caught. Okay? And that team just happened to lose, snatched defeat from the jaws of victory in about four games that year. They just didn't quite have it at the end of the game when it really counted. So when you're looking for shortcuts, and shortcuts aren't there, you lose. Okay, well, that just sets the stage. Now, let's, let's, let's move on. Okay, very quickly. From the reading, and the, I hope you recognize this phrase, this is my friend of Procter & Gamble, Arthur Jones. All organizations are perfectly designed to get the results they get. Okay? Good and bad. And now we're going to work on using the model as a diagnostic tool. So here's, uh, here's a, a, a metaphor of what we're going to do. Uh, the Jefferson Memorial in Washington, D.C. looks like this on a nice evening. Uh, some years ago, the stones, the marble stones, were deteriorating at a very alarming rate. Chips, cracks, chunks falling out. They had to bring in scaffolding and, and repair. Uh, one summer, Charlie and I took our kids up to D.C. and the, Washington, the Jefferson Memorial was closed. It was completely covered from top to bottom in scaffolding. Not nice. Okay? So, the government appointed a commission to study the problem and to make recommendations. And I'd like you to be the commission. Okay? So here are the problems. The marble stones are deteriorating. What's the first thing you want to do to get us out of this problem? Observe. Observe, OK. It may take a while to actually observe the stone cracking. But anyway, no. But, but, but you're, you, you want to go to the site and you want to look and see what's, what's going on. OK, good. What else? Ask why. Ask why. Where'd you get that question? Some of us have done this. Done the, yeah. Five you five that yeah, yeah. Five oh, you've done this? Yeah. Did I do this with you last year? Yeah. Who did this? Yeah. Oh, that John. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. It was another RBL consultant? Yeah. I oh. That's right. That's right. I have a copy of it. All right. <laughs> okay, so why? We'll go through it very quick. We were going to try and impress you and just act as though we I, yes. I say, yes. well, I was, I was already yes. impressed. I was right. impressed. Brady stole my thunder. <laughs> I, I can't improve our learning. I, I can't tell you how many blue chip companies, when I ask, what, what's the first thing you want to do to get out of this problem? They want to use new stones. They want to use different whatever. They, they are already jumping to very specific action steps. The point is, if you don't understand the system, the ecosystem of what's producing the problem, what you think might help might actually make it worse or even worse. It just doesn't do anything. So 
Why? Okay, the stones have to be cleaned frequently. Why is that? Because the pigeons are leaving too many calling cards. Why is that? Because they're feeding on a lot of spiders. There are a lot of spiders drawn there. Why do all the spiders come there? They're attracted by moths. Why do all the moths come? Because the monument lights are on during their twilight period. When moths come out to be moths in the evening, the Jefferson lights are on, and that's where they go. Here's the, here's the picture of the mall, and Jefferson is way over here. The Lincoln Memorial is here. Interestingly enough, the Lincoln Memorial lights were off. Uh, Washington Monument, the lights are on, but that's a, a big granite shaft. It's not an enclosure for, uh, uh, for uh, spiders to be attracted to. And then the White House is over here. And I don't think the capital lights were on yet either. So anyway, so here's this big beacon just attracting all the moths. So the, the root analysis said, get it at the root, stop the cause, turn on the lights two hours later. Then we might need to look at the kind of cleaning materials we have and other things that we could do, but that's it. Now, they still have some problem. I occasionally still see some scaffolding around the Jefferson Memorial when I'm there, but it's not nearly what it used to be, and it doesn't shut the the monument down to the public coming and, and viewing. So the five whys are what we're going to use the model for today on the Grand Rains. So here's the diagnosis process. This was again in the article in the chapter that you read, chapter four. And so we're going to start, I'm going to jump start because we're going to we're going to run through this in less than two hours. And uh, I'm, we're going to work in small groups. Plant in Birmingham has a rate of 80. 80. Duh, we're not quite there. And as you read the case, you will probably have a very clear understanding of why those 80 shutdowns are occurring. So what we want to do right now is find out why. And we start with our first why question down here into culture. So let me do this. Here's the process we're going to use. Each of you, you get five votes for this. All right. From what you read on the case, what are five things that the, see the little fly, the fly on the wall, oops, there we go. the fly on the wall sees what's going on, and you want to identify what the fly on the wall sees going on via what you read that explains why the lines go down 80 times in a ship. Okay. Take yeah. five of those. Describe them in the language that the fly on the wall would see. Put each one of your five on a post-it and put them on your whiteboard. Okay, and then I'll take us to the next step. So do that as quickly as you can, please. Okay? Now, this is individually. Each individual from where I'm from. Let's listen. We're summarizing. Please. So we talked about a lack of accountability that everyone's kind of pushing off, like that's not my job, that's, you know. Okay, everybody is saying, well, do we have a problem? Somebody needs to do something about it. You'd be surprised at how, up, how far up in the hierarchy of large companies that sentiment is pervasive. It's really something else. Okay, so that's, uh, that's why they're stuck at 80, and that, that's why the plant manager is quite nervous about getting to 8. Okay, so that's good. Okay, anything else? We have a theme of fix things as quickly as possible. Okay. And don't necessarily look at the deeper problems or coming up with a process. Okay. Or, or a training. Okay. Regime. It's a good fly in the wall description. The people jump in, they fix immediately, and then they walk away, and there's nothing, nobody looking at. Well, especially if this occurs frequently, yeah. why does it keep recurring? But they get in and they fix it right now, and then that's, that, off they go. Okay? Very good. Did you have any others? Two is about all you have enough time to do. That's, that's good. Okay, over here, what do we have? Lack of collaboration between different uh, players who need to be. All right. Also similar to the first group over here, uh, but you see, it's not only getting in and fixing it. Not only do we not look at what's causing it, but we don't develop anybody else that could be solving this faster. 
poor Jacob has to put on these overalls at 3 in the morning and come in from two miles away to come into the plant. These are real situations. I have, I have personally lived with these situations in a manufacturing plant. And by the time the person gets in and does the magic and then goes home, nobody in the operation knows any better what to do next time. We have to call Jacob again and get him out of bed. So, okay, very good. Over here, what do we have? I know we had a couple of good ones. Two or three. So there was no communicating uh, with the suppliers. So and why is that a big deal? Why is that affecting our shutdowns? The specs for the wet grain and okay. where how they were storing it just wasn't there was okay. a lot of problems that was causing the breakdowns. And All right. Multiple so if we're having problem with material again over here, you can say, well, you know, we just work on the line. We can't do anything to control the the grain, but the plant better darn well make it its business to figure out what's going on there and do something about it. And you have to work with the suppliers in teamwork on that. Otherwise, you, you might come up with the right solution in the plant, and the supplier says, no, well, we're not going to do it. We're giving you what you asked for. There's, there's got to be teamwork between the two. Excellent. Good. What else? So we also said that uh, a lot of the issues was just reactive behavior. They were not really looking at the root causes of the break okay. There was band-aids and those different things. We heard that before too. Good. All right. Now, notice, same database, different groups working on stuff, and we're having some of the same things come out. This is how you start to get a handle on: Have we guessed wrong, or is there really something to this? When you have a chance to see what different groups are doing, and they're coming up with the same information in real life, you would all be members of this system. You will have experienced it on third shift. You would have experienced it in different positions. You would have worked in the supply room as the, as the grain came in. You'd have all of that, and now we're getting the, the wisdom of everybody's perspective on this, and we're starting to come up with a few key themes. This is what is driving the system. Great. What else? We've got one more. Uh, absence of maintenance personnel on all the other shifts except the first shift. Okay. So the fly in the wall sees all the technical experts on the day shift, which is a reward for all the expertise and the years they've spent. But now we treat second and third shift as if it's a different business. If we need the business, if we need those resources on the day shift, don't we need them on second or third, especially if poor Jacob's going to get out of bed and come? Mm -hmm. So we're not structured for the reality of the work. We're structured for the comfort of the employees. Mm -hmm. And we had a P&G plant where this was a major issue. And the plant was about to close because of inefficiencies. But we got the plant leadership and the union leadership to make a common diagnosis. And uh, everybody came out with this understanding. We've got to move some of our talent back onto the production floor in some way or more fashion. OK, very good. Clint? Yeah, well, just to make a point of that, you said that second and third shift needed just as much as first shift. But I know working in a plant, second and third shift need it more. First shift is usually the most experienced folks and are able to bid into those positions. So you're putting your expertise with the people already know it that. So, so yeah, you need it. Yeah. Yeah. See, at PNG, we wanted as much of that resource on each team as possible. We didn't even want to have to, on day shift, we didn't want to have to call the maintenance specialist to come in. We wanted somebody on our team who could do that, who could start training others to do it on our team. We didn't want to have to even make that phone call. We wanted to be able to stop that problem right where it was and get it fixed. Or the the vice president uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I I would Though the logic may be counterproductive or even destructive to the survival of the company, the logic of the system is intact because it all makes sense in some fashion. So now you pick some behaviors and you've spotted why those behaviors are difficult and causing a problem, but the system hasn't recognized that yet. So now we need to understand why are these behaviors happening? So you got four boxes to work with. I'm sorry, got the Go wrong boxes, back. so I'm going to have to backtrack. Okay, 
Let me just give one word definition or a sentence for each of these. People is anything to do with skill level. If people need training, if they need some skills that they don't yet have, then, then, you, then you would uh, pick something in the people box. Structure, if, like our offensive line, if people are in the wrong place, or we got too many, or we got too few, or, or it's just not right, the structure is not allowing the right people to work together, okay? Some of you had the, the collaboration. We may not be structured for collaboration. Most organizations are structured into those silos. We get the specialization, we get the focus, which is good. But then when those silos really need to collaborate on something that's bigger than themselves, a lot of companies, we, we have a lot of clients that really struggle with how do we get these people in different silos to collaborate. So uh, the question here is, are the right people working together as needed, <coughs> training each other on shifts, whatever it might be. If, there, if you see something there, then that explains the behavior that we found. Rewards. Are the right behaviors rewarded or discouraged? What would happen to somebody on third shift if they actually stopped and trained somebody after they come in, after Jacob got out of bed, came in, fixed the problem, and then spent another hour with somebody showing them how to fix the problem that he had fixed? What would happen to Jacob and the person? Okay, Would that behavior be rewarded or punished? If it's punished, it's a sure bet Jacob's not going to spend any time in the plant after he's fixed the problem. He's going home. The reward is he gets back to bed. He also he doesn't get punished, whatever it might be. The flip of that question on rewards is, are the wrong behaviors rewarded or punished or discouraged? As somebody said, there's no accountability. Well, what happens to people who don't take accountability? Are they rewarded for that or are they discouraged from not taking accountability? That's the rewards box. And then the process box is, do we have the right process to deliver what we need? Do we have a process that has any hope of leading us to eight line shutdowns per shift? Or is the current process dooming us to more like the 80 range that we're in right now? And remember from the case, 80 is one of the best in the country. <coughs> By the way, these are real numbers. And I was absolutely floored as a Procter Gamble manufacturing alum to hear that a plant was among the leaders with 80 shutdowns in a shift. The PG heads and equipment would have rolled a long time ago to get that problem fixed. It would not have been tolerated. Okay, so they're a process. So look at those four. In the interest of time, again, you only get five votes. What are the five most influential systemic factors influencing the behaviors, the few that you've identified, in, okay? And so let's try to do this in about 20 to 25 minutes. We'll do the same thing. We're gonna, uh, we're gonna uh, let me ask you to do this. On the top of each of your uh, post-its, when you write down something, write which systems you're applying it to, one of, one of the four, and then stick it up. Then we'll sort them into those four areas, and then we'll have you summarize the key themes out of that. Okay, let's let's try for 20 minutes. I know I was pushing it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. uh, the suppliers and the different things, the needs there. Okay. So we have people. They're not necessarily uh, the skill levels for the second, third shift, and they're also siloed in their own in roles. Okay. Uh, the rewards. There's reward for getting line fixed quickly and not correctly. And there's no communication with the uh, maintenance people or the training. And so. Okay. And structure, the trainers are used to fix equipment and clean up messes and not do what they're supposed to be doing. So they have trainers on shift, but the trainers are not doing what trainers should be doing. Okay? Believe you me, that happens all the time. That kind of stuff. Okay. Very nice. Very nice uh, summary there. And notice, under I like this, this uh, nuance. See, one of, some of you were saying we're having a hard time figuring out what goes in what side, what, what box, that's sort of uh, Some groups get really hung up. At some point, see, in the model, those four are in the same position in the system. They have the same inputs, they lead to the same output. At some level, it doesn't matter what box you put the issue in. If it's an issue and you agree, this is important, don't let the vocabulary hang you up. Put it somewhere and, and, then, and then move forward. So in this one, we're siloed in the role, 
and I might have put that under structure in the, in the, in the purest sense of structure. However, your explanation, David, I like the name, by the way, um, <coughs> the, the, what you, how you described it was the reason they're not getting the necessary skills is because they're siloed in the current job. And that's a very insightful comment. It's the lack of job flexibility that's also inhibiting the ability to build their skills. They're in a comfort zone with their current job. Nothing is forcing them out of that. There's no opportunity to move out of that. They're going to stay stuck there unless there's some kind of people and structural change. Okay? So good stuff. Now, let's, let's move along the line here. I'm sure they're equally brilliant. So our people um, section is pretty similar. Technicians who don't know how to troubleshoot, basically, just okay. increasing their salary. Play wards are really shut down, so they're, the less shut downs we have, the better they're going to their rewards for. Okay. And that kind of plays into the processes. Um, the process for shutdown is to fix it as quickly as possible. So you see the maintenance okay. guys coming in, you see the duct tape or whatever, they up down. Um, and also the structure, the maintenance, and the technicians are separated in different groups. Right, right. Okay, so uh, in some organizations, those two teams could interact and flow back and forth, but that's obviously not happening. Okay, especially if you remember the case, the processing and the packaging techs, most of the shutdowns were on the processing end because of that wet grain or the humid, the moist grain. And what do the packaging techs do when the lines are down? They clean up, they twiddle their thumbs, they take a break or whatever. I mean, you know, is there anything else they could do if they were trained, if they had some skill in that area? So, when, when the Pampers line went down in our PNG plant, it was like a NASCAR pit stop, the pit crew. If that line went down, you had bodies flying, not only from our lines, but from other lines if necessary, to help get those lines up. And uh, some of our new managers that were, that were being recruited they said, the thing that impressed me about this operation was how everybody was focused on the right stuff. So that doesn't happen everywhere, as, as we're seeing here. OK, another very good list. And notice here, um, again, the reward, the minimizing the shutdown at all costs is inhibiting working on the root causes and perhaps some cross-training in the process. We had arguments at P&G about, oh, you can't, you can't develop other people to do this. We'll have more shutdowns. We'll, have, well, there's got to be some kind of balance. There's got to be a system to make that happen. Otherwise, you stay where you are. So, some very good insights there. Very good. Over here, what do we got? Um, so we talked about uh, how all of them kind of affect each other. Um, in processes here, we looked at how um, there's probably a failing in terms of um, the specs themselves and the moisture, the amount okay. of moisture, um, they weren't looking at that. Um, and there's no identification or uh, recording of issues. Um, in structure, we looked at how everybody were in silos, not only vertically but horizontally as well, um, and how it was not evenly distributed. But this structure also helps um, having people not having the technical ability to work on what they needed to because there's no cross-training mm -hmm. because they're of the silos. Mm -hmm. And we also felt like the rewards also helped um, with the people not really learning about other areas um, because there was the reward of uh, trying to get things running again really quickly uh, rather than focusing on the root causes. Um, and then we also looked at um, how in tra for the trainers, there was no reward for them to actually go and incentivize them to train others. Uh, it could be potentially like the loss of their job, or, <clears throat> yeah. Anyways. Okay, very nice. Notice, some of the same points, and I, I think you probably had similar conversations here, but at least in, in your debrief here, you're starting to show how these are interacting, and the interaction is more powerful than any one of the single elements. The fact that they're all interacting towards a common end explains to us why these 80 line shutdowns per shift are occurring. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But these parts are all acting in the same direction to cause the same result. Therefore, it is logical. Okay? All right. Very good. Over here, please. So Oops, we just lost some of our yellow. So on, on structure, we, we add 
you know, there aren't people on the ship that need to be there when they when they have problems. So it's kind of a <coughs> dysfunctional organizational setup. For rewards, there, there's no there's no uh, there's no negative impact if you know you don't get cross trained or if you don't uh, solve a problem. If you just kind of accept the status quo, there's no negative impact for that. Uh, process we talked about how there's no when something happens there's no regrouping session to say okay how can we prevent this from happening again and then on people uh, we kind of debated if this was a process um, or or a, a, a people thing but lack of individual development they had the expectations to cross train but nobody actually reports that okay all right very good we've heard some of these before haven't we in fact, look around the room. Very similar conclusions from all four groups from the same database. When you work in the company from your own experience without a case study, you have a similar database. And the same thing happens all the time. Okay? So for this group, there's no mystery why we are perfectly designed to get 80 line shutdowns per shift. You're, you're seeing it. Okay? We're going to finish this up now. Just as, I'm going to go to a slightly different mode to finish up so we can have a little discussion after as well. Uh, so let's go to uh, let's go to the next step, which is the strategy and capabilities. Okay. And this question is is very specific, and uh, very often uh, here's what I found: the post-its work very well for these first two because it kind of breaks the normal conversational pattern. And especially when you go to post-its, if you've got a senior person in the room and you're filling out your post-it, you don't know what the senior manager is filling out on his or her post-it. So there's no waiting to see what the right answer is from the senior person in the group. Everybody has got to get to or in the water, so to speak, and you've got to go for it. And so uh, we break that pattern with these first two. But some groups get a little irritated with it, some don't. Some, but anyway, I give them their option. So we're going to use the option here because it's a little faster for all of you now. We, we've, we've got a common base for these first two steps, right? in terms of behavior and the systems that, that are causing it. So now the question is, what connection, if any, is there between what we found so far and the formal strategy of this company? How does any of this connect with the formal strategy of the company? And again, what we're focusing on is greater reliability and this eight line shutdowns per shift. Okay? So the strategy what did you see in the case that was a formal strategy, and does any of this that we found so far does it connect with that strategy? Do it now. Do it now. So now, oh. now we can just talk in the group, please. So you're asking Thank for you. what um, elements of the strategy are leading to these issues? Right. Right. The formal strategy only. So if the formal strategy is around getting product out, then they're incentivizing, you know keeping the lines, getting the lines up and running as right. quickly as possible, right. and reducing time of shutdowns rather than frequency of shutdowns. Is that their formal strategy? Do they know their formal strategy? I guess the case said something about being like very high quality. Okay. So I, and that's something that maybe I didn't understand right. If their like strategy was to get like everything out of the door, as fast as they can. How come their whole like brand was about we're like the top quality? We we were to like more about you know the quality of our products than just getting everything out of the door. Okay, if they stand for quality, does this line up with that? It doesn't. Okay, let me tell you when when results are off. It's not unusual for people to have the same blank that you have right now as you look at the strategy box. Even if they know what the strategy of the corporation is in and out. You've drawn some nice lines between they are a quality company. They are trying to reduce costs. They are obviously, they think that a way to do that is to reduce these line shutdowns, etc. But they are primarily, their products, they take pride in the quality, but they're getting undercut by lower cost competitors. So they're trying to reduce some costs and maintain the quality to give them a better edge in the marketplace. None of this stuff lines up with that. And this is not unusual. When you go to the formal strategy, the whole system has drifted away from what they say they want to do. 
Now, what do we what do we what do we call it when a person says one thing and does another? A liar. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. They don't walk the talk. Integrity is missing. See, this is organizational integrity. When we get to this box, we get a measurement on organizational integrity. Our strategy makes certain promises out there to our customers. Our systems are not walking the talk. Our customers cannot have confidence in our integrity. That gets people's blood boiling. They don't like to be, they don't like it to be assumed that they are not people of integrity. But the system does not have integrity. Okay, that's the issue. That's what we're finding here. Okay. So that's step number four. I'm sorry, please. I was just gonna say that um, the plant manager, uh, I found this in my professional experience too, but when they say that they've got we want to be the top producing plant and we want and we're getting pressure, we want to be known for quality and we want and when people seem to have like those top three goals, one does generally seem to to get uh, executed further. Okay. And I think we're seeing that they want to be the top producing more than they want to be known for quality, and that's getting through more than Thank more. you, Becca. And where is that coming from? Is that a top corporate down. strategy? No, well, it's from the plant manager. It's from the plant manager. Is that part of the plant strategy? <laughs> it's the plant manager's go get them pep talk. It's the plant manager's go get them pep talk. That is not formal strategy. I'm sorry. If it were, they'd have some kind of formal declaration, whatever. You'd have it on the wall or, you know, whatever. It's not there. It's what the plant, now, it's a good plant manager. He's got a lot of credibility, a lot of good experience. And this is what he thinks needs to be done right now. It's not unusual for a leader's strategy to also be at odds with what the company is all about. And so, see, what we've now pointed out with this step is we're out of alignment on a number of things with what the real strategy of this company is supposed to be delivered. Okay. And we will continue to get these results instead of even what the plant manager wants. We won't even get those results. Okay, uh, now, step five. If, 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 all of, if, if all of this does not align very well with the formal strategy and capabilities, something is causing it. We haven't got the root cause yet. And so the root cause, if it's not here, it, it could be from here. It also could be a combination of here and here. But since there's nothing there that we found, now we go to the underlying values and beliefs of people in the system. And actually, Becca, you actually put us our, our first bullet point under that one. The plant manager wants us to be the leaders in production, in, in delivering the, the cases. Okay, that that's that's a that's a plant leader, a very influential plant leader. That's a, a value or belief of the individual that he's now trying to rally the troops around and get commitment for. Okay, so that's one. What other what other underlying values and beliefs? Did you detect? It's probably not stated very well in the case because a lot of these things are invisible. They're hard to find. But what other evidence do you find of what people have in their head or in their heart of what they really think ought to be done that explains some of this craziness that you found? So please, Gary. I kind of felt like the people weren't there to figure out how they're working best for the company. Okay. I felt like they're working best for like their roles and their jobs, okay. um, just simply because, you know, there wasn't the willingness to kind of go up and say like, okay, well, what can we do to like improve things for like in general for the rest okay. of the company. Okay, so <clears throat> there's some reference there to comfort zone. There's some reference to uh, people not wanting to learn a new skill. They're they're happy with what they've got. <coughs> that's that's what you're describing, and so. Yeah. That seems to be more than just a few people. That's pretty widespread throughout the plant. People have, have, have settled into a comfort zone, and they don't want to have to move out of that, even if the company requires it. The same thing with the P&G plant, when we realized all the talent, the, the, the most experienced and strongest technical talent is now off of the production floor, and we're suffering in production. But none of those people want to have to go back on shifts. Well, I'm sorry. This plant, they may not have a plant a year from now if we don't start to get some of these people back here. And the union leaders were the 
ones that were also in on all this aha and understanding we've got to do this. This is this is what we've got to do. So please. Well, and that goes along with what they said in like the introductory paragraph. They're known for being really good to their employees. And so because they want their employees to be satisfied and they want them to like their work, they're not willing to put them in uncomfortable positions to get the work done. Create observation. We value our people so much, we certainly don't want to hurt their feelings or disturb their comfort level by asking them to do something that the company needs. This is like my friend, whose business was hinging on two people in one step of the process that couldn't do what everybody else agreed were no normal performance expectations. Gee, I, you know, you know, I can't do anything to disrupt them. They've got families to feed. Well, how long are you going to feed your family if the plant goes down? So. Excellent, excellent observation, please. So in the plant that I was in over the summer, there was a lot of, we were moving in the direction of starting to cross-train people on different um, machines and in different walls, and there was a lot of hesitance from the um, line workers because they felt like two things. One was a sense of pride because they'd been doing the same thing for so long that they felt like they were the expert there, which I guess goes into like feeling within their comfort zone as well. Mm -hmm. But the other thing was they felt like if everyone was cross-trained, that it would be threatening their position because it would put everyone on the same level. So there might also be an underlying belief that um, if they move in the direction of standardization, that they don't mean as much anymore. And so the reward system for them personally shifts. Right. It may have nothing to do with the paycheck. It's their status within the plant is now. We had in our plant in Albany, Georgia, when the first women with our system of multi-skill development, when the first women achieved the top pay level in the plant, and we had a welder who had work resting on the face of the moon when he worked for the government. You, can you imagine what some of these deep, technically skilled people thought when a woman was on the top pay level in the plant? But those women's teams that they were the leaders of were the top producing teams in the company for their product. Now is that contribution close to putting something on the face of the moon? See, in terms of the company. So, okay, very good. All right, one more, David. There also seemed to be a focus on uh, the community. They were priding themselves on focusing outside and having this leadership and all that, whereas they weren't focusing well enough on doing that inside, okay? So let's just, th this is excellent. Let's. Uh, walk me through our, our five again. We had, um, Becca, you started us off with the plant manager wanting to put the focus on production. We want to be the most productive plant, getting the best volume of cases shipped out, whatever. Okay, that's an underlying belief. That's number one. Then we had Jerry with the, uh, everybody wants to be, to be comfortable. They're not necessarily wanting to do what's best for the company. They want to do what's best for them. The reward system, they don't want to disturb that because they've got a position of status and, and expertise and respect, and they don't want to lose that perhaps by sharing with others, okay? Tell me your name again, I'm sorry. Charlie. Charlie? Yeah. Oh, I, I think I can remember that one. <laughs> okay. So Charlie, I'm sorry, give me your, uh, your point again, which was? Oh, that the company is concerned about being a good employer to its employees. Yeah, we don't want to do anything that would any way step on our employees you know it's a noble thought in the abstract in reality we've got we've got the question the real question for an organization designer can you do both can you maintain the integrity and the, the treating people right but also a focus on what the company needs from from our work system okay and then we had David tell me again yours uh, it was a focus on promoting leadership and everything out in the community. Oh yeah, yeah. We're so focused on what's going on out there and our impact in the community, and we're not, and we don't, we don't have to worry so much about the operation. And that's how we've got the 80 shutdowns per shift. Okay, all right. Now, do you see how those underlying values and beliefs, they add up here, don't they? Don't they explain why we have systems set up the way we have, why we're getting the behaviors that we're getting? And, and notice how after working on the common base, these ideas came from everyone in the group, from different groups, but now we're all, we're all on the same page, literally, in the room. Uh, we've restructured companies with 
this size group doing what we've done here for diagnosis and then for design. Uh, one was a financial services company. Uh, they've been growing about 3 to 4% a year. Their CEO had a vision of cross-training and going through the silos and all of this. And we had the top 30 employees of the company, and we went through the diagnosis, we went through a design, and uh, there was no resistance to change. Because the people that had to make the change were the people who understood the issues and who would help design the solutions and were not committed to make it happen. And uh, coincidentally, for the next eight years after we had done this work and they rolled out the new design, they had double digit growth every year for eight years in a row, as opposed to three to four percent a year. Now, is that does that help anyone's standard of living? To have that happen? Okay, so. All right. Now, number six. How well aligned are the underlying values and beliefs and the strategy with our mandate of eight line shutdowns? This one's pretty self-evident. We're perfectly designed to get the results we get, not the results we want. So we'll need to do something. Now, what I'd like to do, we've got just a few minutes. Please take 7.3 minutes in your group. Uh, let me jump ahead. And forgive me, I've got to shift through these slides real quickly. But here's what I want you to do. And I apologize for not having the right stuff in there. We have done some revision with these materials. Here's what we want. In your group, seven minutes. Look at the six bullet points. If you can only pick three of these areas to work on, you don't have to tell us what you would do. You just need to tell us why you would pick these three to work on first and not the other three. All right? Just take seven minutes, please, and then we'll just hear from each group and see what you come up with. Are you here? Uh -huh. I think we ended on strategy, structure, and underlying values and beliefs. Okay. <laughs> Over here. The two of us agree this group is sure we had a good idea. So, structure, people, underlying values and beliefs. Okay. And the answer is strategy, strategy, <laughs> underlying values and beliefs, like and reports. Like Rewards. Okay. Now, if we had time, which we don't, we would probably hear from your rationale for why you chose some of these. There's probably some commonalities that would allow us to kind of condense this a little bit. All right. But we'll just take it as it is right now. Underlying values and beliefs. Uh, if we were going to take this as it is, we would do underlying values and beliefs. Strategy, which uh, strategy, structure, and reward. So, if I'm benevolent, we go with four priorities and not three. And if we really looked at structure, I'm guessing there might even be some process issues that we can cut across back and forth. Anyway, doesn't matter. This is somewhat artificial. This is only saying if you had to make a choice, which of those three would you pick in the first round? Which might be like a six-month cycle and then you would address some of the others. In the purest sense, in a system, you want to address the things that you found in each of those elements because if they're all feeding this in the same direction and you can counter all of them in a different direction, it makes it much easier to get the results that you want rather than the results that you've been getting. So, I will say this. <coughs> Even at BYU, this is an unusual consensus as we've done this in the past. This doesn't happen very often. Um, let me let me just somebody give me one one structural change you would make. Who, who chose structure? Is there one structural change that you had in mind as you as you picked that one? Go ahead. Yeah. So the one that we'll describe if there were um, your receiving, your processing, and your packaging where they're kind of horizontally aligned, we would create um, a structure where it was just along the line, so that becomes one structural unit. Okay. Um, so the structure would match the process, correct? Because it's laid out in the process flow, but the organization is set up differently. So you would align that. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, let's take one of our underlying values and beliefs, which was our comfort zone, and the company's underlying value and belief. We don't want to s stomp on the comfort zone of our employees. We want our employees to be happy and to like us. Those two go together, right? 
Now, if I'm sitting there listening to your well thought through proposal about realigning the structure to match this process, and I'm sitting there with my underlying value or belief around we don't want to do anything that's going to turn off our people or to upset them, uh, and I don't want to have the, my work changed in a way that moves me out of my comfort zone. What's going to be my reaction to your structural proposal? And even if you are the plant hierarchy behind this proposal, it leads to what I often call guerrilla warfare. You're at the peace, trade, uh, peace treaty table. Everybody signs the document, and then as you leave the building, the guerrilla warfare fires from the bushes and from around the corner, and et cetera. In other words, the fighting has not stopped, even though you've reached a so-called truce agreement. When, when these are not addressed, these things are very fragile especially if these are deeply entrenched, as, as we found in the case. So, you know, the way we uh, described it when I was with the, the Covey organization, uh, Stephen used to say, if you want incremental change, work on these things. If you want fundamental, uh, stable change, you've got to include this in the, in the mix. Most of our clients, they do better at this after going through this process, but it's not always as strong as, as you all got it here. So I salute you for that. That's good work. Okay, now, uh, we got just a couple of minutes. What we just have simulated here is what you might very well be facilitating with your client group based on their issue in a few weeks. And so we wanted you to get a, a first-hand flavor of what that looks like, what it feels like, what some of the benefits are coming out of it. Uh, so let's just, let's just uh, very, very quickly, what are some of the things that you found that are helpful out of this process? Please, stop. You didn't give us the answer. So the idea that the consultant isn't telling them what to do, they're coming up with it on their own using the framework. You put people who know what they're doing in their business in a room with this process, they will have the answers. You don't have to be the expert. I've done this in all kinds of technologies and industries some of whom, I, I mean, I know the consumer industry and then some parts of manufacturing, but there's a lot of stuff. Financial corporation? Do, do I know how to help a financial institution get into double-digit growth eight years in a row? There's no way I know how to do that. But you get the right people in the room with this process, you steer them through the process, they will find tremendous answers. Okay? Thank you for that, Scott. Other feedback? Yes, please. Mary. In addition to that, you already have their buy-in right from the beginning because they yeah. were the ones Whose product is it? It's theirs. Yeah. If I had known this before my internship, I think so. Well, maybe that's why there's a second year. <laughs> we can't give you all the answers. The first year, you wouldn't come back. Okay? I, will, I will tell you this. We've had graduates of this program walk into their new situation and use this approach and the things that they learned here. And uh, in the competitive world, they shine in their new companies not only against other new hires that are entering the company for the first time, but for free people who have been around for a while, and even people that have been in HR positions for a number of years, they don't have the skills to do this. They don't have the skills to understand this. And so there, there's a, a tremendous advantage of what you can do right off the bat as you get into your new situations. So anyway, okay, uh, Jerry, one more. I really liked how we did things individually before breaking off into groups, so it gets away from like, the group think mentality, and perhaps personalities that would be more forward and would push their ideas on others. Um, I think it's really good to be able to see that process. That, that's the biggest benefit that I have seen through the years as we have done this. It, 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 people have to get used to it. They, 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 you know, this, it's not normal way of doing things. I did this with a group of managers in Russia, in Moscow, in 1991 where they didn't even know what a flip chart was. We brought flip charts and markers in. Some of you wanted the lemon scented marker. I, I can still remember a Bolshevik engineer with four ink stains on the tip of his nose <laughs> because he'd gotten a little too close, but he was really into, let's see, he was into the cherry, he was into the blueberry. <laughs> you know. uh, but they went through this process, and when we asked them for their feedback, they said, how did you learn, how did you know so much about us? I didn't. You you did it all. Okay. That anyway, some great successes there. Um, okay. Um, questions that you have. <laughs>
We've got just a couple of minutes. So in the client meeting where we be doing this, are we walking them through like great grain first and then their own? Or would we just walk them no. straight through their own? We'll, we'll talk about that as we, as we get into it. Okay. Uh, you will probably introduce them to the process. And again, like we did today, I would recommend that you would fill in the first two boxes with them, stakeholder needs and okay. results. And you would then out of that identify the scope of what you were going to do with the diagnosis. And then you'd get a, you'd have them, you'd help them nominate a group of people to come together, probably eight to twelve people. And you then you, your group, would you could divide it up, but we've got materials for you, don't worry. But your group would facilitate them through this process in no more than a day. And, on the 23rd, we're going to allow you to walk through another case. We're going to go through another case, uh, another very robust case, again, based on real dynamics. And you're going to, in your, in your client teams this time, you're going to go through another round of this. And then we're going to, uh, you'll, you'll summarize that work. And then uh, we'll go through a design simulation where you will be designing against what you found in the diagnosis. So we'll be picking up from there. And now you'll be testing real design considerations against what you found. And that will then set the stage for your second workshop with the client to go through some design stuff. Okay? Our goal is to help you learn how to facilitate, to do what Dave did as we're going through the next right. case. Right. So you'll, you'll get the skills. And that's why that. Charlie videoed it. And uh, we'll, she'll get that done by at least 3 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> and uh, she's saying it. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get it off. We'll get it on there uh, soon, and then you can go back and refresh if you want to uh, mm -hmm. on it. And in the meantime, you'll be selecting your client teams that are going to work together, and you'll have a chance then to uh, to go through this again. I start to get ready for it. Could I take just a second sure. on your assignment for next Monday? What I've asked you to do is to be able to get your head into systems thinking. Can you tell? What Dave's trying to teach us to do is to think about not a single problem. Let's do what the plant manager said, and let's reduce the number of uh, shutdowns, and let's just let's keep this thing going. Well, that's part of the problem. He's, he's not stopping to see the whole system. He's just forcing something that's causing the problem. Well, what I'm trying to get you to do now is to take the reading that you've done from Jake Albright, from Peter Sange, either have done or will do. I understand that I gave you permission to skim that. But these are people who are systems thinkers, and then Dave's article. And using that, pick one. Of, just pick a problem, a performance problem from your uh, a current church setting, a family setting. Uh, some of you had internships. Where, you know, we've just been hearing Megan talk about hers, and I think Mark, you has several of you have had some situations. Think about a particular problem and say, okay, with a systems point of view, what sorts of elements would I have suggested they consider beyond? the single solution or, or, or particular element they were working on. This is a two-page paper. It can be single-spaced. This doesn't count a lot, but it's trying to get me to, I'm trying to get you to think systemically. What are the systems elements? And you now have a model that Dave's given you from his chapter four, as well as some other suggestions from Jake Albraith and from Peter Sengue. What sorts of things might we raise? And I'm trying to just get you to get facile with this so you can start doing that as you start talking to clients as well. Has, any questions about the assignment? It's a two-page paper, individual, submitted to, to me before class next time. Just email. Don't don't do a paper. It helps if I and I can and I can shoot it back to you, Marie. So, so the paper is just the problem. Or the paper is walking. No, the problem is it's the problem, okay. and then saying, okay, given what I've learned from the system thinker, uh, uh, what other elements, systems elements, might have caused that problem? And how would that? How would, does a systems model help me? think that through or help somebody else think that through better than just here's the problem let's get at fixing why is marble deteriorating okay ready set goodbye <laughs>